Washington Grown is brought to you by the Potato Farmers of Washington. Learn why Washington is home to the world's most productive potato fields and farmers by visiting potatoes.com. And by Northwest Farm Credit Services, supporting agriculture and rural communities with reliable, consistent credit and financial services today and tomorrow. And by the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Office of the State Aquaculture Coordinator, supporting the viability and vitality of Washington agriculture. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gorenson and welcome to Washington Grown. Here in the heart of Washington State, the beautiful Yakima Valley is home to 47 different varieties of grapes and hops for breweries around the world. In this episode, we're going to learn about some of the hard-working people who are innovators for the beverages we enjoy. We'll visit De Brule Vineyards, where quality grapes are the top priority. Since what we're growing for is quality, mm -hmm. it's more important to us to have good fruit than a lot of fruit. Then we'll visit Los Hernandez in Union Gap where you'll find some of the best tamales in the world. They're just delicious. You, you know, are the me. tamale king. <laughs> and I'll take a tour of No Life Brewery in Spokane. You got pipes and you got hoses and you got passionate people moving things around. And I'm in heels. And you're in heels. We'll yes. let it pass. <laughs> we'll, we'll pass on that. All this and more today on Washington Grown. Bon appetito! There are no fingers in there. There's no either, fingers so. in it and they, and they still look green. <laughs> this is happy food right here. That is heaven on a fork. <laughs> look at that smile. <laughs> oh, I've never done Sweet, that before. Right? Got my hard hat on. Let's go. Okay. We're taking a trip to Union Gap, just outside of Yakima, to see how Los Hernandez tamales are taking the world by storm. Since 1990, Felipe Hernandez and his family have worked hard to grow this little business into a James Beard award-winning, must-stop destination for tamale lovers everywhere. The food is always perfect. I've never had tamales like this before. We make tamales at home too, but this is really unique. They were really good. Very flavorful. You can't stop eating them. About how many tamales do you sell on an average day? It's in the thousands of dozens. To keep up with demand for his tamales, Felipe had to construct a large commercial kitchen off-site where workers make his famous tamales two shifts a day. I ordered a dozen of tamales, a half chicken and half pork. The seasoning of the meat is really good. Um, the ratio of the meat to the mesa is really good too. You can smell them. It smells oh so good. Gosh. Tell me about the James Beard Foundation Award. <laughs> well, that was a surprise, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Who would have thought? I mean, tamales. We have people come here from all around the world. Does that seem so crazy to you? It does. Felipe credits the hard work and tradition that his family put into developing his signature masa recipe. The moms, the grandmas, the abuelitas, my sister, all of those people that have made and struggled and, and tried to make a living. And here I am. So the honor goes to them. Coming up, Felipe and I will be making some of his famous tamales. You're not doing it because it's cheap. Right. You, want, you want quality food. Yeah. You want someone to say, this is good. I'm in the Yakima Valley visiting the De Brule Vineyard. This vineyard has been repeatedly recognized as one of the top vineyards in Washington State. So I'm meeting with Carrie Shields to learn how they grow their world-renowned grapes. So you've gone all over the world studying wine, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. That's cool. And then what brought you back? Here. That we have the best wine grapes in the world. <laughs> in Washington. I love it. Well, and it's also a really unique opportunity because I could work in a place like California, I could work in a place like Europe, but Nowhere else do we have, we're in this perfect moment of there, it's dynamic, it's innovative, we're discovering, we're doing an amazing amount of research. We have some history and some knowledge, but we're at that moment of really defining where the industry is. So it's a very exciting place to be. Carrie took me over to their Riesling vines, some of the oldest in the state. She explained that during this time of year, they're busy working on pruning. And we need to make these better. Okay. Because you can grow for quality or you can grow for quantity. 
but a lot of times you have to trade off for, for quantity if you're trying to get better fruit. Okay. So what we do is we pick these longer shoots and say you only get two clusters. Oh, so then they're so gonna... we go down to the beginning, we say this guy gets one, two, so mm -hmm. we'll get rid of that. Get rid of that guy. Okay. So every time we do this, we reduce our yield, we reduce our profitability, but we increase the quality. And since what we're growing for is quality, mm -hmm. it's more important to us to have yeah. good fruit than a lot of fruit. In addition to pruning, they're also busy covering the vines. These nets help protect the grapes from hungry birds. So we will lose our entire crop to birds. No way. Yeah, the entire we, crop. If we don't cover them with nets like this. And the starlings come and attack from the top. But so the, this helps protect that. So this helps protect that. But the robins, if we left it like this, the robins will fly up underneath and eat everything anyway. Smart suckers. So what we're gonna do is every couple of, like every other vine, mm -hmm. we'll just take one of these bread ties and stick it through and tie the nets together yes. and tell the starlings to keep yourselves out of right. there. That's a good spot. Luckily, they're faster at this than we are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> Carrie said the vineyard is located on a basalt hillside that the ancient Columbia River used to flow through. As we were walking, she found some evidence of that river. And you can see that these are different different geological sources. So you've oh, got yeah, different absolutely. river rocks uh -huh. from different parts of the Canadian Rockies, yep. different colors or different minerals. And this is basalt. Mm -hmm. And so this is the bedrock of all of all of this hill and, and all of the all Columbia this River. just makes it, it makes, great. Yeah, it makes it really unique and interesting. Mm -hmm. Carrie said they make up to 3,000 cases of wine each year. Next up, the tasting room. So this is our Cabernet Merlot blend from the Hillside Vines where we were putting the nets on today. Awesome. And this is our flagship, one of the yeah. top scoring wines in Washington every year. Thanks for sharing. And it's got that nice brule cherry, but lots of... Ooh, it's smooth. It's really good. You guys do a great job. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking me out into the field and... Well, thanks for coming. ...to come back here and cool off a little bit and enjoy your fabulous wine. Yeah, feel free to hang out as long <laughs> as you want or come back anytime. <laughs> I'm at the Columbia City Farmer's Market and I'm visiting the Timber City Ginger Beer Booth to see what Washington products they're using to make their delicious beverages. How many different flavors do you all do? We've got strawberry in our cans right now and then on top we have raspberry jasmine. In, I'd say from like November to March, you're gonna see a lot of apples and pears. <laughs> like a lot. So what type of Washington grown products do you all feature in your ginger beer? So the raspberries that are in our ginger beer today are from Hayton Berry Farm right over there. Um, all the pit fruits that we use, the apples and the pears, we have an incredible relationship with Collins Family Orchard right on the other side of you. So throughout the year, it's a really amazing opportunity to be able to highlight not just what is grown in Washington since there's so much bounty here, but also all of the amazing small farmers that work so, so hard here. So what are we gonna taste here? So this is our newest seasonal flavor. It's raspberry jasmine. Lime. <laughs> Wow, just as it's going down, I feel like I can see a little grocery list of all the different flavors. So, do you enjoy ginger beer? I do, and my kids really, really like it. This is a raspberry ginger beer. Awesome. So, drink up and let me know what you think about that. Wow. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful. It's like more gingery than strawberry, like not too sweet. I like it, I can taste the berries. It's just nice, the ginger flavor is mellow and the raspberries are not too tart. It feels fresh, I mean, it feels very light. It's really refreshing. It feels really good going down and it tastes very fresh. It feels like someone really put some care into this. And of course, I'm gonna wanna know what kind of drinks you make with this. <laughs> I mean, like grown-up drinks, that's fantastic. Do you know how many inches of rain we get in the Yakima Valley every year? Find out after the break. Coming up, I'm making tamales with James Beard award-winning chef Felipe Hernandez. They're just delicious. You, you know, are the me. tamale king. <laughs> and we're in the kitchen at Second Harvest trying out some chocolate beer cupcakes. In the Yakima Valley, we only get about seven inches of rain every year, which is what gives us these small berries, small clusters, and such high quality grapes that we grow here. We're back at Los Hernandez to see how James Beard award-winning Felipe Hernandez and his team are making a big impact from their small town. What seems to be people's favorite tamales here? Overall, it's been the growth of the asparagus in a vegetarian. We do that in the spring because of the harvest that we have here. 
the local crop and bringing it in, you know, <laughs> from farm to table, that yeah. thing. And it's not just the local produce that makes their tamales so special. So tamale is the masa, it's not the meat. The masa, the cornmeal, oh my gosh, it's so good. I haven't had, no, we, like, I the tamales are usually the harder of the masa, but um, these to me are just sort of just really delicious. Yeah. I've never had masa that was so good, flavorful. So yes. you're gonna show me how to make some of your famous tamales, yes. right? Yes, we're gonna put our shortening here Okay. do this. So this is where the the spices. some of the flavor comes yes. from. We heat up the shortening and add some flour to the pan. After cooking the flour down for a few minutes, Felipe adds in his secret spice mix. Is it yes, secret? it is. It's secret. Okay. It is a secret. It's thing. a secret. And wow, this, is, yeah. this looks great. Look it's at that very color. Tasty. Yeah. Then we'll take this and we throw it in here with the meat that was prepared. And this or is this chicken. Shred, this is chicken, chicken. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And you will stir it and just all the way around. Get it all blended together. And it gets tiring, it is, a, it is work. Yeah. But you have to do this. So this then cools? Yes, then? we have to cool it now. It should be 180 or thereabouts. You can't put this in a tamale because it would just all... Yeah, it would just run out. Yeah. Yeah. While our chicken tamale filling is chilling in the freezer, we prepare our jalapeno and cheese tamales. And so de-seeding these helps Kind of keep the heat down a little yes, bit, right? Yes, it does. It, it, you know, I don't know individually one is hotter than the other. Right. But at least we're trying, trying exactly. to regulate it. To and work so around. these yeah. come from well, around here. Uh, the harvest is beginning to start here now. Yeah. So we will use what we can out of the local area. Yeah. Awesome. Everybody else supports us, so we want to support the right. farmers also. The next step on this, we cut it in the in the strips like this. Okay. Now the next thing we do is this the masa here. So this is the key to everything. Yes, this is already blended. It has our spices, our special blend. Yeah. We incorporate in it. What we do is blend this all together. You gotta okay. put some love into it. Okay. I'll throw it in there. Oh my gosh, this is so good. Right. I can't believe how much cheese is going yeah. in here. Yeah, so you can see the, the jalapeno, you can see the cheese. Yeah. You're not doing it because it's cheap. Right. You, want, you want quality food. Yeah. You want someone to say, this is good. We didn't put one cube of cheese right. in the whole tamale. Try to find it. You're not right. going to find it. You know. <laughs> now we're going to assemble a tamale. Okay. One of the important things, too, is the quality of the corn house. Get a portion that you want. Okay. Say like this. Yeah. Say, and just roll it like this and then conform it just like that. And then roll it. And you want to roll it. You know, so you have some at the end here, so it's filled up. And then you do fold this in. Oh, I got it the wrong end. That you fold it to seal it. See how this is right here? Uh-huh. So it goes this way like this. Okay, and then you lock it in. Uh, okay, that one looks that pretty looks good. Like, yeah, that yeah? looks good. There okay. you go. And it is kind of fun to make them, though. Oh, it is. This yeah. way, see? Yeah. There you go. Now you're a professional. Look at those. Once the tamales are assembled, Felipe steams them in a pot and they're ready to eat. And a lot of folks don't know that. You don't eat the corn husk. No. I <laughs> don't want to insult you, but don't eat the corn husk. I'm going to have a bite also. Mm -hmm. You're right. The corn The masa is amazing. I can tell that there's a lot of love in here. They're just delicious. You, you know, are the me. tamale king. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the French paradox? This is the medical observation that French citizens have lower rates of heart disease despite high consumption of saturated fats. It's widely thought that the lower risk can be attributed to the consumption of red wine. Now, thousands of studies have tried to answer the question of whether light to moderate consumption of red wine provides any health benefits. While the scientific community is still trying to answer that question, the current hypothesis is that any potential benefits are likely a result of the polyphenols found in grapes. Polyphenols are plant-based antioxidants that play many different biological roles in our body. One polyphenol, quercetin, was shown to dilate blood vessels and lower one's blood pressure. Other polyphenols are being investigated for their ability to reduce plaque formation in blood vessels and reduce the risk to heart disease. Washington is the number two producer of all grapes in the U.S. and grows nearly 70 different types, with over 1,000 wineries to choose from. Impressively, 
the grape and wine industries are responsible for an estimated $6 billion impact to our state's economy every year. And we can all cheers to that. Coming up, I'm taking a tour of No Lie Brew House in Spokane. So let's try a beer. Nice. Drink it up. Isn't that great? The Yakima Valley is becoming known for its premium wine grapes. So today I'm meeting with grape expert Dr. Wade Wolf to better understand why this region produces some of the best wine grapes in the country. Tell me what viticulture means exactly. It is the study of the culture of grape vines. Okay, and tell me about the viticulture of this area, the Yakima Valley. Washington doesn't have any natural native grapes. There are a lot of states, uh, California and the Midwest, East Coast have their own native grape species. Okay. Washington never had any, so in the turn of the 20th century, uh, grapes were introduced into our area here. Also, because there's never been any native grapes or past grape cultivation, we're also very free of pests and diseases compared to a lot of the other wine growing areas. And that combined with our nice arid sunny weather mm -hmm. here yeah. uh, makes it ideal growing conditions for the wine grapes. So tell me about, we hear a lot about AVA, right? Uh, what does that mean and, and how does that relate to this area? So AVA means American Viticultural mm -hmm. Area and it is a federally designated wine grape growing area that was created in the early 1980s by, by the federal government. Okay. And so we're located here in the Yakima Valley AVA, which was the first one, not only in Washington State, but in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, wow. So this was done very early on to yeah. designate the Yakima Valley as a premium wine growing area. Wade said that there are 47 different varieties of wine grapes grown in the Yakima Valley. So I asked him why this area is such a perfect place to grow premium grapes the plate tectonics that created the Cascade Mountains. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a rain shadow here, uh, reduces the amount of rainfall. So it's an arid wine growing area. And that combined with the high light intensity in the warm summers uh, creates, uh, the, again, a, a pest-free ideal growing conditions here. We have such a diverse microclimates within this AVA that we can grow essentially any of the wine varieties that have originated in Europe. We need to go have a glass of wine sometime, yeah. right? <laughs> I'm gonna do that. Great beer doesn't just happen. It takes hard work and dedication. Here at No Light Brew House in Spokane, owner John Bryant focuses on quality and community to create beer that's a step ahead. No Light is basically a community brand. And we have 80 people that live and work in Spokane and Seattle that all drive this machine every day. And I hope in the DNA of our culture is that we are a fabric of this community. Well, and people love your beer. And the world loves your beer, right? Because you've won some awards. Yeah, I mean, this won a, a medal at the International uh, Beer Cup, which is really awesome that it came from Spokane, came out of the state of Washington, from people that all live and work here. And we truly are Washington grown. Today, we're getting a behind the scenes look at what it takes to make great beer happen. So Christy, this is uh, No I Brew House. You know, we're really hands-on. You got pipes and you got hoses and yeah. you got passionate people moving things around. And I'm in heels. And you're in heels. We'll yes. let it pass. <laughs> we'll, we'll pass on that. So this is a 30-barrel tank. 30-barrel The tank. equivalent of that is 60 kegs. That's so, a lot of beer. Yeah, it's a lot of beer. <laughs> and 100% of it, all of our ingredients are from this region. I'd love to take you up into the brew house. Okay. Uh, the eagle's nest, as we call it. Okay. And I'll let you see how the magic begins. I'll follow you. Okay, okay, let's do it. So this process, you have the wort, which is kind of the genesis of beer. We've separated out from the spent grains mm -hmm. to the liquid that comes over the wort. They'll cook it up. We'll be adding hops at certain times of the boil. And in the end, they create different flavors. From this step, we'll transfer it to a heat exchanger to cool it down. And then we put it into the fermenter, uh -huh. add yeast, and yeast creates the magic. Yeah. Everything we have is from the region. The, the hops are from the Yakima Valley. The water's from the beautiful Rathrum Aquifer. There's amazing water. Yeah. And the barley malt's all from this region. It's one thing that makes like the beers in the Northwest and really Spokane have a leg up, is the water that we have is amazing. And then the malts that we have are in our backyard. 
and the hops in our hops backyard. Hops in our backyard, yeah. Uh, we keep a vibrant and healthy yeast strains that we try to use actively and then get a fresh one. So the beer is always really working hard for you. I like that. It's working good. hard for me. Yes, for you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. This is our can line. You basically get the can with no lid. Okay. They come down the, uh, the rinser so they're sanitized. Then they go through uh, a CO2 shot. CO2 keeps air out. Air is the enemy of really, really fresh beer. Has a five head filler, so all five cans are filled at one time. It makes a right hand turn and it seams on a lid really quick. They stack them on that pallet. They'll run them next door to the cooler. And within two hours, that is picked up, taken to our distributor and to a grocery store. So let's try a beer. Just Nice. Drink it up. This is a little Wrecking Ball Imperial Stout. That's really good. Isn't that great? Every morning, you know, first thing in, we do sensory every single day. And sensory means you're tasting it. You're actually tasting that beer. Yeah. You're popping that can mm -hmm. off the line. And you're trying to see in that part of the process, are we holding up the goodness of that beer? Are we losing something along the way? And that's kind of the magical part of like really making it yeah. special. You know, an interesting stat is in 2012, about 98% of all the beer in Spokane was made from some other city, some other state, or some other country. Today, that number's pushing up to 20, 25%. That's all locally created and locally yep. purchased, made in Washington, and enjoyed in Washington by Washington customers. A lot of love goes into that beer. A lot of love. Tomas and I are in the kitchen at Second Harvest Food Bank in Spokane, and we are joined by Laurent Zarati, the chef and owner of Fleur de Sel. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's a great pleasure to be yeah. here today. Thank Taste you. Taste testing, which is a great job. It is. Not yeah. Bad. Could be worse. <laughs> To do that every day. Right, exactly. <laughs> so well, allrecipes.com is where we found these recipes that we're featuring here on Washington Grown. And this one is chocolate beer cupcake. So best of both worlds, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I love desserts. Chocolate love beer. and beer. Go. <laughs> and whiskey. And whiskey, yes. So let's explain. So this is from Meow the Cow. And these cupcakes <laughs> oh, are made from scratch with stout beer filled with an Irish whiskey chocolate filling topped off with some Irish cream icing. Ooh, that there's some... Good There's some rich. flavors. Yes. <laughs> and so for our recipe, we're gonna we're gonna use uh, no light porter. Yes. So no light yes. here in Local, Spokane. Spokane. Yep. We love them. Yep. Yeah. I have a huge sweet tooth, so you know, <laughs> bring it on. Well, what are we waiting for? So hi. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Well, Laurent can hardly contain himself. I cannot, I cannot, I gotta. <laughs> Any time is a good time for a cupcake, right? I know. Mm. Oh, man. Yeah, that's good. That ganache inside is really mm. rich. Oh, my God, that's so good. <laughs> oh, man. 
I didn't see the inside. <laughs> right. Love it. Get into I that. just hit the inside. That's fantastic. Oh, He's in heaven. Good. Oh, yeah. And that Irish cream is so perfect mixed with all it's these It's so good. Oh, man. Breakfast, mm -hmm. lunch, dinner. <laughs> and dessert. And dessert. <laughs> Kim said that she actually made it into a two-layer cake instead of cupcakes. Oh. And so she put, uh, she filled the layers with the Irish cream frosting and then she put the chocolate ganache on top. On top. Oh, what a great Cover idea. it, right. make it, yep. Right. And if you put a little more uh, cream mm -hmm. and uh, less uh, chocolate mm -hmm. in that ganache, you could have a nice icing nice on it. Nice pretty layer. Yeah. Exactly, it will yeah. be, wouldn't be that, uh, yeah. that hard. So it would, would be a perfect chocolate cake instead of a, a cupcake. Right. You make it a chocolate cake, a birthday chocolate cake. Yeah. But we like this, this is portable. <laughs> I can put at least three in my purse. <laughs> Take them with me. Or we'll, we'll watch. Or we'll watch. <laughs> There's a few in the back. We'll see what happens to them. <laughs> It'd be a great, uh, a great thing for St. Patrick's Day. Oh yeah, it's a great idea. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Beer and whiskey, sure and nice. chocolate in a cup, in a cupcake. <laughs> in a cupcake. And serve with another no lie stout so right good. next to it. There we go. <laughs> Cheers. Love it. Love it. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> To get the recipe for these chocolate beer cupcakes, visit wagrone.com. Whether you're enjoying that nice cold beer or pouring yourself a glass of spectacular wine, it might have just had its start here in the Yakima Valley. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. We'll see you next time. <laughs>